Chang Mu Kwon positioned itself as a superior martial arts school that taught eight different practices at once. Though this may have originally struck prospective students as a bargain and a half, many who chose to take it up would come out the other end having lost thousands of dollars, personal relationships and job opportunities, and even their sense of self. Before the school's founder and four other defendants were jailed in 1995, various experts had told reporters that Chung Mu Kwon fit their definition of a destructive cult. Welcome to Let's Talk About Sex, a podcast about cults around the world. I'm your host, Sarah Steele. Before we continue, a content warning. This podcast deals with issues that some people may find disturbing, related to emotional abuse, physical abuse, and controlling behaviours. There's also a little coarse language. Please use your discretion as to whether this will be suitable for you and those around you who may be listening too. John Chul Kim was born to Yong Hua Kim and Yun Sil Kim in South Korea on the 1st of April 1933. He was said to have started his martial arts training at the age of seven. According to a Chung Mu Kwon related biography, the man who was to become Grandmaster Ian Kim took to, quote, the solitude of the mountain and ocean areas of Asia to practice the forms and techniques that he learned. The same bio says that Kim won the All-Asia Championship in 1956, but when CBS journalist Pam Zekman asked the USA Taekwondo Federation's Tai Hee Nam whether it was possible to become champion of All-Asia at that time, he told her it was not. In spite of the supposed championship title, the biographies claim that Kim wanted to learn more and mastered all of the eight main martial arts styles over the next seven years learning from elite practitioners across East Asia. His vision was, quote, all martial arts united. Kim brought this vision to America in the early 1970s, but not before, quote, demonstrating Kyonggong Sulbop by jumping from the equivalent of an 11-story building in 1970. Kyonggong Shulbop is a flying sidekick particular to Chang Mu Kwan that's meant to involve bouncing off the air. Kim supposedly repeated the feat soon after moving to America in 1972, this time jumping from an eight-story building without injuring himself. Kim opened his first martial arts school in Illinois in 1973, and his first Chang Mu Kwan school three years later in 1976. There would eventually be schools in Minnesota, Texas, California, and Massachusetts, as well as Illinois. The John C. Kim-style School of Chung Mu Kwon advertised that it taught eight martial arts as one, and they were 18 weapons, Kong Su, Kung Fu, Taekwondo, Tai Chi, Hapkido, Aikido, and Judo. John C. Kim's bio goes on to say that in 1975, Kim was offered a motion picture contract from Warner Brothers as their choice to fill the void left by the death of Bruce Lee, but Kim declined in favour of continuing to teach martial arts. He was then said to train up outstanding black belt students between 1977 and 1982, then from 1983 through to 1989, he trained up specially selected instructors and masters from the third to the eighth degree, at which point the school became known as Chung Mu Do, giving him an opportunity perhaps to step back from the day-to-day as his chosen teachers took on the running of the schools. John C. Kim officially became Grandmaster Iron Kim and retired in 1996, though it's unclear how or why this transition happened from the website biography. 
Well, the retirement bit is probably because he would have been in his 60s by then. I should mention that the bio also talks about Kim wishing to pass on, quote, his mudo therapies and cures for many illnesses. I'm all for having a variety of interests and even a second career, but it's hard to see how he could have found the time to study medicine in much detail considering the implied focus required for all of the martial arts skills. Along with stories of jumping off buildings, students would be told of Kim curing people of deathly illnesses in their hospital beds and confounding doctors and living in a tiger's cave to hone his abilities. In case you couldn't tell, in trying to find out the true history of John C. Kim, one has to wade through an awful lot of unlikely tales. CBS journalist Pam Zekman investigated Chung Mu Kwon in 1989 and referred to Kim as a former maintenance man in her television report entitled The Cult and the Con. Here's former Chung Mu Kwon student Russell Johnson, who spoke to me for this episode from Minneapolis. He came in over here in the early 1970s and was a, a, a janitor. And you know, it wasn't uncommon for the Koreans to come over here and not have any martial arts degree, but proclaim themselves a black belt or a master. There was no internet back then, and they could pretty much claim whatever they wanted. He made up all these stories about his life, and I actually wrote to the Korean government, and they had no information. And then I know some of the top Korean martial arts masters in the world, and they've never heard of him. And so, you know, I reached out to Korea, and could not find anything. I did find like references to a sister, mother, uh, but as far as him even being a martial artist in Korea, uh, there was no records that I could locate. Russell Johnson is an actor, producer, and filmmaker who joined Chung Mu Kwon when he was in high school. He's got a podcast called Deceived the Mu Years, which you should have a listen to if you're interested in this organization. And his podcast website has a wealth of materials that Russell has uncovered over the years about John C. Kim and his martial arts schools. I utilised a lot of his hard work for this episode, and Russ told me that he actually became a private investigator after exiting Chung Mu Kwan, as he became so focused on uncovering the truth. He's a guy who's had many careers in his lifetime, and he generously gave up some of his time to talk to me about his experiences. I grew up in a low-income neighborhood, and I was raised by my single mother. I was looking for that male role model, and this was the 1970s, the late 1970s. Martial arts uh, was real popular there, Bruce Lee, and TV shows like Kung Fu with David Carradine, and Chuck Norris uh, movies were really, you know, that was like the height of when he was really popular. At that time, I decided I wanted to take martial arts, so... I went to the phone book and I saw an ad for the John C. Kim School of Chumaquan, which proclaimed that he was the retired champion of all Asia. Uh, and later I'd find out that that did not exist. But it was the closest um, school to my house. From the moment that I walked in, the place was impressive. Uh, you could feel there was like this weird kind of aura around it. There was an instructor and he was about 27 years old at the time. He moved like no one else I've ever seen before. He had me throw a punch at him, and he hit me so many times. I couldn't believe it. It it was like seeing someone out of a movie, and I was impressed with him. This instructor's name was Alex, and Russell later found out that Alex, as a teenager, had worked under Cam Ewan, who was a consultant and stunt coordinator on the television show Russell loved so much, Kung Fu. I was a, a complete fan of that show, and just to have an instructor that had a connection to that show meant a lot to me. And so I was thoroughly impressed with him. And 
you know, right from the beginning, he started telling the magical stories of John C. Kim, the, the ability to run from Minneapolis to Duluth in 45 minutes, which is, you know, if you break it out, it's 206 miles per hour, or the ability to cure any disease. And so the stories like that started right away. And, you know, I was 16 years old, and this was 1980. And there was a lot of people that were older than me that were telling me this was true. And in the back of my head, I was saying, this can't be true. But then the front of my head was uh, nodding in agreement. Russell grew up with epilepsy. And by the time he started up at Chung Mu Kwan, he was smoking pot regularly, socially with other kids his age, but also because it kept his seizures in check. Alex pulled him aside and told him he had to stop smoking if he wanted to continue the training. And so I left the training for a little bit at that point. And then I came back once. I, I, one day I just threw all my pot on the toilet and I decided to go back. And then I started like training like really one-on-one with him. And I was failing in school and uh, he told me to bring my grades up to A's. So I actually got them up to straight A's. And so in that part of my life, when I was 16, it was a good part of my life. And I didn't see all the negative things until later on. While Russell was having a very positive experience with Chung Mu Kwan in his mid-teens, it would later come out that in 1982, a property bought by the school that became known as Kim's Farm was purchased with student money and subsequent building and construction work on John C. Kim and his head instructor's houses was completed by using students as free labour. At the end of high school, some of the true motives of the organisation started to show themselves, but Russell wouldn't see things for what they really were just yet. Alex started talking to Russ about his future training opportunities. I was graduating high school and he talked to me about giving my money that I'd received from my family for my high school graduation present to the school as a down payment for their $3,000 black belt course. But once I gave him the money, then he told me that, well, I'm not going to put you in a black belt course. I'm going to put you in the course below that. And so it was a bait and switch type of thing that had happened. to me. This bait and switch caused Russell to lose faith in his trainer and the school. So he left for the second time. This time he stayed away for about a year, but he couldn't stop thinking about all of the things he'd seen and learned about at Chung Mu Kwan. And then uh, one night, I actually, I got drunk and I wrote a letter that I wanted to come back. And when I came back, there was new instructors there and Alex was gone. Russell was told that Alex had moved to California and then later that he had lost his mind over a woman and turned his back on John C. Kim. Alex later told journalist Jennifer Vogel at Minneapolis's City Pages, quote, At the time it seemed like we were all working together. They would tell you that your mind was strong and that you were powerful, but Kim was pushing all the buttons. The students were investing their time and money in the school, promised the possibility of becoming an instructor or having a school of their own, but that wasn't happening. All the proceeds were going to John C. Kim. When I finally left the school after five years of instructing, I left without a penny, with just the shirt on my back. Six months after his return... Russell was paying the school another $500 deposit for the Black Belt course. Well, what they did is is they they made it out that I might not be accepted, that not everyone is accepted in the Black Belt course, and that uh, I have to give this money, and whether they accept it or not, you know, they they, they created this fear of me not being accepted. On the big day... Russell's instructors told the regional head instructor all the reasons why they thought he should qualify for the course, and he gave his reasons for wanting to qualify. Finally, he was accepted into the black belt course he'd been yearning to join, and the instructors spoke to all the other students about his achievement, telling them that next it would be their time, and they too had to work hard if they wanted to get into the course. 
the the whole idea is they were creating this idea that you might not be accepted and the the truth is anyone who came up with the money unless they were mentally ill or someone like the schools didn't like gay so they called them uh liberace types after the the piano player and so if there was something like that that they, they didn't like about them they wouldn't be qualified but the whole idea was to get those students who were not in the black belt course thinking about it after i became an assistant instructor then they started teaching me how to get these people to sign up for black belt course how to get the information for them and when they started teaching me this i had realized how i had been manipulated according to the cbs television report and later legal submissions a black belt course went for 10 to 15000 dollars an olympic course for 15 to 20000 dollars and an instructor course for 20 to 30000 dollars Pam Zekman spoke to some former members who said they'd paid the school up to $50,000. One ex-member said that they ended up giving their paycheck directly to the school and would be provided some spending money back from that. A spokesperson for the Illinois Attorney General's office later told penthouse journalist Lawrence Gonzalez for a 1992 article that ended up going unpublished, quote, If they perceive you have a lot of money... They have instructors stand on either side of you and pressure the money out of you. They don't want to tell you how much it costs, because it costs whatever you have. When he later became an instructor, Russell and the other instructors were taught to ascertain what level a student would be able to afford via a method they called sideways conversation. He explained the concept to me. It's to get information from a person in a way that they don't understand your agenda to get it. So I, I'm having this casual conversation with this person, and he doesn't know that I have an agenda of finding out what kind of car, what he does for a living, you know, what his financial position is. And he just thinks I'm like buddying up to him. What would happen is once I got this information, I would give it to our instructors, uh, my, my superior. And then we would meet at night, and then we would take the person's picture and we'd talk about the individual. And then we would talk about how to manipulate him to get him into the black belt course. And the thing that worked well about this is we all thought that we were doing it for their own good. First year student Chris Newcomb told Jennifer Vocal in 1992, quote, I'm paying $4,800 to get to black belt. That's twice what other schools charge. But what they teach there is 10 times more than what they teach at other schools. Lawrence Gonzalez's unpublished penthouse article included the following quote, All mind control experts agree on one thing. The greater the sacrifice, the stronger the commitment, and the harder it is to break the bond of loyalty between cult and victim. Russell told me that the schools kept dossiers on students, with detailed personal information, and former instructor Jeff Austin told Pam Zekman the same. He said that by the time you got a new student into the office, you'd hope to have intimidated them enough that they would sign up to a black belt course right away. Here's Russell again. A student or someone who was a prospective student would come in, and I'd take them through a free lesson. And my instructor would tell me, get in on him. And that meant make him feel pain. So what normally would happen is that I would tell him that I'm going to hit him lightly in the stomach and just relax. And then I hit him with an open hand and they would normally go down to their knees. And something different happens at that point where they, uh, they become submissive at that point. And it really was an important part of that indoctrination process to get the person to follow the instructor's lead. Former Chung Mukwon student Kurt Chappell told Jennifer Vogel, quote, I was black and blue from my neck down to my shins many times when I came home after training. They used to beat on you. It was intimidation. 
It was considered wrong to block a punch from your instructor. You weren't allowed to. The parents of former instructor Jeff Austin, who featured in the Pam Zekman report, eventually brought in a deprogrammer to get him out of the school, and Jeff would later come to see Chung Mu Kwan as a destructive cult. As an aside, the practice of deprogramming is highly controversial, and there's a documentary called Deprogrammed by director Mia Donovan that's worth a watch if you want to know more about this. Another former instructor told Pam Zekman that they were directed to put competing martial arts schools out of business and to put the other school's instructors in hospital. Although Chang Mu Kwan practitioners didn't compete against any other martial arts schools, some saying this would have exposed their training as inferior, in attacking other schools' instructors, they made sure to have the numbers on their side. A number of former students shared with Pam that they'd been told Chung Mu Kwan had caused the death of Bruce Lee in 1973, the story being that he was a former follower who had revealed Chung Mu Kwan's secrets. Those training to be an instructor were told that they would be set for life once they got through the course, as well as learn the secrets that would mean you didn't have to worry about anything anymore on your road to success. Not only this, but journalist Rick Kahn quoted from the Provisional Chung Mu Kwan Constitution for his article in the Boston Phoenix in 1991, the goal is to see others learn and understand right justice. As their minds and bodies improve with the proper training, the right judgment they learn can benefit their families, businesses and living conditions. As whole communities begin to benefit, it will lead to a better standard of living for all, and ultimately, a stronger United States. In spite of this idea of right judgment that could benefit families, and further teachings about how the art would strengthen relationships, Russell Johnson would later find out that John C. Kim himself had been married three times, with children born from each marriage. When Russell was undertaking the instructor training, he was still paying $350 a month, plus extra costs for exams, while the school also profited from his many hours of teaching. By comparison, other schools in the area were charging $35 to $75 a month. With Chung Mu Kwan, $100 was referred to as $1, $200 as $2. Russell was told that this was because money meant little to John C. Kim, but minimising its significance was likely a way of getting students to part with it more easily. Russell, like many others, was working three jobs and rarely got enough sleep. It was repeatedly framed as a great investment in his future. Sacrifice now and reap the rewards later. Chairman Kwan, you know, all of us, if you didn't have like two, three jobs, you weren't considered clear, right? You know, you were trying that hard. And by the time I wrote down how many jobs there were, it, it was like close to 37. Students were also expected to bring cash gifts for their instructors and masters on all kinds of occasions. They were taught that the most respectful way to pay was in cash, as that's how it was done in Asia, and if students asked for a copy of their contract, they were accused of not trusting the school. Though they were given ID cards registered to the Asian Chung Mu Kwan headquarters, the school's attorney Nick Gallo told Pam Zekman that there was no Asian Chung Mu headquarters that he was aware of. Nick Gallo himself would later be named in lawsuits brought against the organisation. John C. Kim had derogatory names for people of colour and homosexuals, and reserved an especially low regard for women. Kim had labels for people. You know, women were no minds, blacks were well-done ones, gays were Liberace types, Jews were hook noses. The amount of resentment that he appeared to have towards women, we weren't able to sign a woman up on the first day of the month because it would bring bad luck into the school. So first we had to sign a male up, and it could be even a child, just as long as it wasn't a a woman. Russell told me that there are many stories from women about their specific experiences with Chung Mu Kwan that he hopes will be able to come to light one day. 
There was a lot of superstition taught by the organisation. Students were trained to enter a room stepping right foot first, and to avoid the number four as it was very bad luck. Broken mirrors were also bad luck, but there was a way you could counteract that one. This is from the book Herding the Moo by Joe Smith. Chimacon believed that mirrors were the gateways to other dimensions, and that if a mirror is broken in the school, that it brought uh, evil spirits into the school. And so the way that a, a mirror had to be dealt with is that the instructors had to find dog manure, and they had to rub it around all the edges of the broken mirror, and then they had to find a moving creek, and they had to throw the broken pieces of the mirror over their left shoulder on a moving body of water. <laughs> One night I was sleeping, and I had a waterbed. It was three o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden I had this pounding on my bed, a hard slap. And without even thinking, I woke up and I jumped to my feet in my underwear. And yes, instructor comes out. That's how I responded to my instructor. And my instructor was standing in my room, and he told me that my waterbed was facing the wrong direction, that it was unlucky to have my head facing north. So it was three o'clock in the morning and I had to drain my waterbed and change the direction. At this point, Russell was living in chair accommodation with other student instructors. While his mother had initially been enthusiastic about his involvement with Chung Mu Kwan. Then when I moved in with other instructors, she started to worry about it. They could hear me on the phone sometimes when I was calling my instructor. And so, like, I would call into the school and most of the conversation would be go, yes, instructor, yes, instructor, yes, instructor. And you never really use the word no, it was frowned upon in there. So they, they saw that happening. And Chumacon had moved, like, several of my friends to Chicago. They actually had a compound there. And I, I pretty much did keep a relationship with my family, but I knew others who didn't. It really varied on their position. Some people in Chicago left uh, family f for years. The control extended into other areas of life as well, with students being told they would have sex only once per week so as not to be drained of vital energy. Dating became hard because I'd, I'd bring a date to this apartment building where I'm living with these other guys and we're speaking in this language and were calling each other instructor and assistant instructor at home. So that, that was very hard on a lot of us dating because it, the whole thing was pretty strange. This language that Russell refers to was a particular kind of broken English that was expected of all students and instructors when speaking to their superiors to reinforce the hierarchy. When I walked into the school, First thing I do is I would say, hello, head instructor. And I'd say, be right to ask if there's anything I can do for school, because the school always came first. And then be right to ask if you're self-care for anything. So be right to see, be right to ask. These were, were common things that were said in the school, and it became like a broken pigeon English. And what they did is they were emulating John C. Kemp, because he was the perfect, uh, perfect human being. The question, be all right to ask if I can do anything for school, might result in having to swing by the supermarket, as students would end up buying anything the school needed, including toilet paper and stationery. They'd also have to provide receipts so that the organisation could claim the expenses on tax. The other side of the rote repetition each day of, be all right to ask if yourself needs anything, was that this question gave instructors the chance to ask students to bring along some food for them. This was framed as the opportunity to give back to one's teachers and an honour, when in reality the instructors might be barely surviving, and this was the best way for them to feed themselves. One instructor, uh, he was told that he would make a certain amount of money, and he told us that he was getting ready to retire, that he was making so much money as an instructor. It turned out he was making $12,000 a year. He had a wife and four kids, and he couldn't even pay his rent.
It was an event that would find him close to death, that would set Russell Johnson on the path towards his eventual exit from Chung Mu Kwan. By 1987, Russell was learning to run a school. One day, his instructor left a note for him behind the front desk, facing in a way that he couldn't see it. Russell was so obedient to instruction by now that he would not dare step behind this desk, as that was forbidden. The next day, he got in trouble for having missed the directions on the note. Chumacon used push-ups as a uh, discipline. If you did something wrong, you walked into the school with your shoes on, you didn't bow to the instructor, you didn't follow their direction. And the push-up was a, a combination of a yoga downward dog and a regular push-up on your knuckles. And it had a weird reaction where it put too much pressure on the tricep muscle. People who did too many of them, the arms would actually lock up or uh, they'd become full of blood and you would not be able to touch your face. Russell was ordered to get his uniform on and do 100 of the push-ups. He'd done this many push-ups before, but this time he wasn't given time to warm up. What happened is after I got done doing the 100 push-ups, when I went home that night, my arms started to lock up to where I couldn't touch my face. And, you know, I, I thought, okay, a couple of days and the swelling will go down and things will go back to normal. The next day I went into the school and uh, I was in a lot of pain because I couldn't sleep that night. And my instructor looked at my arms and he had never seen anyone have as bad of a reaction as I did to it. And he called the national instructors and they told him to press him some pressure points to try to relieve the the blood. And it didn't work. So I was told, okay, in three days, the national instructor is going to come down and he's going to do acupressure and he's going to fix you. So I I went home uh, again that night and slept. I didn't sleep, excuse me. I, I had to lay on my back and hold my arm straight out uh, in front of me. And this went on for three days. And the last night, I was in so much pain. Uh, I I took a bath with Epsom salts. I hadn't slept. I was like delirious. And I decided that I was going to go to the hospital, get some sleeping pills and muscle relaxers, and not tell uh, my roommates that I was going to do this. Because Chum and Kwan taught that they could cure anything, that they could heal any disease. And, you know, John C. Kemp could cure cancer. He could cure AIDS. Russell found himself thinking of a story he'd been told about John C. Kim visiting a man on his deathbed in a hospital. The man, even on his deathbed, was said to have tried to get up to bow when John C. Kim entered the room, and John C. Kim told him to stay down before curing him of whatever his deathly ailment was. When I got to the hospital, they had told me that my arms had what was called compartment syndrome and that so much pressure had built up in my arms that it it couldn't be released. And during that time, my muscle tissue was starting to die. It was starting to go into my kidneys. And they told me that they had to do an emergency operation. And if they didn't, I would either lose my arms or die. Even with this news, Russell remained so devoted to his teachings at Chung Mu Kwan that he didn't immediately authorise the surgery. He called his roommate and asked him to tell the school that he was at the hospital. Because I, I, I didn't want them to think that I didn't believe in them. So my roommate got down to the hospital first, followed by my instructor. And he called the national instructors who gave the hospital permission to operate on me. When my instructor got there, I was laying in bed before they operated, and I had a catheter in, and you could see the dead muscle tissue coming out, and they had fluids going into me, and I tried to stand up and bow uh, from the hospital bed. So after he gave them permission uh, to operate, they told me that, you know, they didn't know how severe the damage was to my arms, and whether I would wake up with my arms. And when I woke up, there he was again. And then I tried to bow again. I've seen some of the photographs of what happened to Russell's arms after this procedure and is really shocking. A quick warning that he goes into a bit of detail here about some pretty distressing stuff 
So if you want to skip ahead 30 seconds, we'll forgive you. What happened, what would transpire from that day forward, I would be in the hospital for 16 days. For five of the days, my arms were cut open in the back from the shoulders to the elbow. And they, they literally looked like what happens when you put a hot dog into a microwave. I was in a, a lot of pain. And after that, my instructor never returned. Only one of uh, the instructors came, and that was a guy I went to high school with. But from that time forward, they just sent assistant instructors. Russell got out of the hospital on a Saturday and was back teaching classes on the Monday, even though he still needed help to dress himself. He was terrified of losing the opportunity to become a Chung Mu Kwan instructor. And so then uh, the instructor started asking me why I went to the hospital. And they denied that I ever went to them for help and was told to wait. So they started passing this uh, story around all the other schools that there was a student who got injured and went to the hospital, and now he's deformed. And it's his fault because he didn't believe the, the school could help him. Russell didn't know until about a year and a half later what was being said about him at the other schools, until another student who saw the scars on his arms in a changing room came up to him and told him about the stories he'd heard. During this period, Russell had also finally met John C. Kim himself for the very first time. He was a short, heavyset Korean with a a belly on him. And one of the first things I noticed was his perm. I noticed that all my instructors were getting perms and they were growing mustaches. And all those things were being emulated from Kim. Kim was the perfect person. So they they did those things. And so I, I'm looking at him. And so I'm envisioning the greatest martial arts master who ever lived sitting in a beauty shop with his hair and curlers and getting a perm. And they, they also had these stories that John C. Kim could uh, be like a shapeshifter, that he could become any animal, any person. And you know, I'm thinking, okay, you can do all that stuff, but you can't perm your own hair. <laughs> he started telling stories about living in a mountain in Korea with tigers. And then he would start getting to his point. And these stories would go on all night. And he would, during the middle of the story, or towards the end of the story, I should say, he would say meanings. And you think, okay, he's going to get to the point, I'm going to understand what he's talking about. And then he'd say meanings. And then a whole new story would start without never getting to the point of the last one. This was about 3.30 in the morning. And I started to notice people start to like pass out. And he would look at them and he'd say, see, too much mind getting And by the time that night ended, he had pretty much taken us and said that everything that we did, every commitment we had was just the beginning and that we had not yet begun to earn the level of knowledge that he's going to pass on to us. And and so you're thinking all the, the blood, sweat and tears and the money that you've given him, but this is just the beginning. So it was that night uh, that uh, the seed of doubt was planted in my head. I found it really interesting that in this case, meeting the leader was something that actually created doubt for Russell. He told me that he could see why others might have found John C. Kim quite charismatic in person, but he reminded Russell of some of the con artists he'd met growing up in a neighbourhood with some dodgy elements. And then a few months later, I met Kim again at the school, and he came in and he, he did a demonstration. And it was this bizarre demonstration where he put his arm on a, a chair and he he slapped it. And he said that he was going to make his arm grow. And he said, mm, watch my arm grow. And then he's, he's saying that his arm is growing. He's like, how big do you want it to grow? I can make it as grow as big as my leg. And, and I'm looking at this and I'm not seeing anything. And and he's like, do you see? And here I am with all the other people. And I'm going, yes, master. Yes, master. All of us were telling him that we had seen his arm grow. And some people actually believe. But for me, there's that part of the back of my brain was going, I don't see shit. It, It was just like one of those things where, okay, I'm in conflict here. 
Here you can get an idea of how these myths about John C. Kim managed to gain so much traction amongst students of Chung Mu Kwan. Both nights, the night that I met him the first time and the night at the school, I would go back and I'd tell the students the, the glory of John C. Kim and how I actually seen him do these things that he did. it, And that's pretty much what my instructors did to me. But there was this conflict going on because I'm going, I didn't see anything. So when Russell was told by the students about the rumours going around the other schools regarding his hospital stay, it made him see red and added to his mounting feelings that something wasn't right with the whole setup. It took about a year and a half before I finally left. But the, the seed of doubt after meeting him the first time, and there's other people that after they actually met him would leave. Uh, one of my friends uh, actually saw him wearing makeup one night, and that made him leave because, you know, here John C. Kim is supposed to be a shapeshifter, and to make himself look young, he was actually wearing makeup. And it, it was uh, kind of a bizarre thing for my friend, too. And then the next time I would see John C. Kim was during the court trial when I was pointing him out to the reporters. In September of 1988, a man named John Bryce Maddox drowned at a birthday celebration held for a Chung Mu Kwan national instructor at Kim's farm. Games were often played in a pool at the farm, including a whirlpool game, where instructors ran around the edges of the pool, creating a current in which anyone losing their footing would be swept up. John Maddox had been complaining of chest pains previously, and also suffered from epilepsy like Russell Johnson. His family later told Russell that John also suffered from mental health issues, and Russell had heard rumours of John being treated poorly at the hands of Kim and the senior instructors. That September night, he was still allowed to participate in the games, and in the early hours of the morning was found in the pool in a semi-sitting position, under the water. CPR was administered, and John was driven to Edwards Hospital, but he was pronounced dead at 2.45am on the 19th of September, 1988. The drowning was concluded to be the result of a heart attack in the pool, and the death was ruled accidental. 911 was never called. John Maddox was 44 years old. It was a couple of months after this incident that Russell did finally pull the cord. After the best part of a decade in Chung Mu Kwan, he knew it would mean a massive shake-up of his life. On the 2nd of November, 1988. There was one day where I, I'm at work and I call my instructor and I'm like, hello, uh, head instructor. Bright to say this is instructor Russell. Bright to ask if I can do anything for school. Bright to ask if you're self-care for anything. And as I was hanging up that phone from work, I'm like, fuck it, I quit. I snapped at that point. And at that point, I had actually been uh, living on my own for a couple months. Being by myself and away from everybody, I started questioning things even more. But when I hung up that phone and quit there, that also meant I had to quit my jobs. And uh, I had three of them at the time because they knew where I worked. And so when I didn't show up that night, I pulled the shades down in my apartment and shut off all the lights, shut off the phone. and then they started coming and they started knocking on my windows and and this went on for six weeks the first night though i was in complete psychological breakdown i was rolled up in a blanket next to my bed hiding in the darkness from them and i had no idea how i ended up there i asked russell if he'd known to quit his jobs because he'd seen other people be harassed after trying to leave chung mu kwan and his answer surprised me at this point in time, he hadn't yet come to terms with what had really happened to him. 
I wasn't afraid that they were going to harass me. I was afraid that they were going to bring me back. They wanted me back. And, and, and I knew that I had to get out. Uh, I knew something was wrong, and I didn't know what it was. You know, everything in my being was telling me to get out. While she was researching her special report for CBS, Pam Zekman was told by Chung Mu Kwan representatives that the school owners would come after her, that, quote, they're not a gentle group, and that representatives she was speaking with feared an accident would befall her if she didn't drop the story. Former student Will Smith Vanith filed a civil suit against the organisation in 1989 after alleging that he was grabbed by the throat and asked, How would you like to die right now? When he asked for a copy of his contract. The school settled with him out of court. This was the same year Pam Zekman's report came out, which resulted in a number of students leaving the schools. After this, Chang Mu Kwan did start giving students a copy of their contracts. 1989 was also the year the school was renamed Chang Mu Do. In the meantime, Russell managed to begin getting on with his life, and over the two years following his departure, reflected on everything that had happened as he went to college to study business and accounting and had his first reconstructive surgery on his arms. The next day after I got out of the hospital, there was a phone call and there was an instructor from the school. They wanted me to come back two years after I left. And this was after the Pam Zekman report. And so I, I, I did not know about the report at that time. So I, I agreed to meet with him, but I wouldn't meet in the school because I was concerned that if I went back into the school, that they would have control. We agreed to meet at a restaurant. The instructor they met with, I knew him since I was 13 years old, and he had actually been in the school as well. And I told him that I wanted John C. Kim to know that I went to the school and I was told to wait. With his reconstructive surgery bringing his original hospital stay fresh to his mind, Russell was still of the conviction that John C. Kim just hadn't yet been told the truth of the situation. What they put in me was so strong that, you know, after a couple of years of evaluating, I still didn't quite get that John C. Kim was a total fraud and that he was a monster. Russell had no intention of returning to the school, but he still wanted this truth to be known. And when nothing came of this request... Russell finally figured he might get some legal advice on everything that had happened to him. It was the attorney that suggested that I had been in a cult. For me, I started to question, okay, so what makes one karate school a cult, uh, another not? And I got a book, Combating Cult Mind Control by Steve Hassan. I read it all the way through that night. By the time I got, got done, I understood that I was in a cult. And then a few months later, Steve Hassan actually had come to Minnesota, and uh, I met him and uh, got some counseling from him. But what happened at that point is I, I, I started researching Chumaquan, and I, I had all these questions. Where did they come from? I, I started researching public records. I got a hold of the Pam Zekman tape, and this would begin six years of questioning what happened to me and how could it happen. When Russell started speaking out against the school, Chung Mu Kwan put up wanted posters with his picture on them, accusing him of libel, conspiracy, fraud and slander. In Texas, they put up wanted posters for former members Jeff Austin and Kurt Chappell. In August 1990, seven schools, an Illinois apartment and a Texas ranch were raided by the IRS for Chung Mu Kwan accounting records. 
By 1991, the Illinois Attorney General's office had filed charges relating to fraud and coercion against John C. Kim and his businesses. Numerous affidavits relating to the case alleged incidents of violence used against students who tried to leave or asked too many questions. In October of 1991, Chung Mu Kwon was also being investigated in relation to the death of former student and instructor Robert Ludden, who had been missing since August of that year, before his body was found in the Beck Lake Forest Preserve on October 4th. The 35-year-old's death was treated as a homicide and the school was eventually cleared of any involvement. In a notice of filing in June of 1992 related to the Illinois Attorney General's case against Chung Mu Kwan, the plaintiff's fourth amended complaint referred to basic operations of the Chung Mu Kwan organization and documented various accusations against the defendants. A few notable points related to lessons in life provided to students and included, quote, that when Armageddon comes, those who have advanced rank in the Chung Mu Kwan organization will have an assured place in the afterlife, that students cannot trust people outside of the Chung Mu Kwan organization, including parents, siblings, and friends, that if students leave the Chung Mu Kwan organization, they will lead pitiful and mindless lives, that the higher belts will know what is best for each student, thus students should obey all instruction from higher belts, whether related to Chung Mu Kwan training or other aspects of life, and that nothing is more important than Chung Mu Kwan training, therefore students should sell their belongings and give the proceeds to the school to pay for further training. There were further points about John C. Kim's supposed abilities. Quote, Students were told by defendants that Kim possessed supernatural powers, including, but not limited to, the power to make one arm grow larger than the other, the power to raise himself from the dead, the ability to jump off a seven-story building without being harmed, and the ability to heal diseases and injuries by merely touching a person. In 1994, John C. Kim and five other instructors were fined $4,000 in the Illinois Attorney General's case and compelled to abide by the state's Physical Fitness Act and Consumer Fraud Act going forwards, which included maximum fees of $2,500 per year for any courses. They'd soon move their operations away from Illinois. Then on the 11th of April 1995, an arrest warrant was issued for John C. Kim himself. He was charged with conspiracy to defraud the United States of America. During the federal court case, various stories came out, including former students who testified about loyalty challenges, in which John C. Kim would ask whether they wanted to leave the school or die. The loyal student would choose death to pass the challenge, and John C. Kim would choke them, only letting go just before they were rendered unconscious through lack of oxygen. In December of 1996, John C. Kim and four of his followers were convicted of conspiracy to evade taxes on millions of dollars in earnings. Six other accused had pled guilty prior to the trial. John C. Kim was sentenced to five years in jail, where he would remain until the 13th of April 2001. Chung Mu Do renamed its schools in 1999, while John C. Kim was still incarcerated, and today they are known as Um Myung Do. Kim continued to head the chain, and its website still includes much of the mythology of the eighth grandmaster. It's hard to know if the school is doing better these days, but in 2005, King 5 News' Chris Ingalls reported on claims from 26-year-old Mike Rothwell that he'd lost $20,000 to the school. And in 2010, former student Vivian Francis brought a suit against Um Myung Do in San Diego for damages related to fraud, negligent misrepresentation, wages owed, 
and sexual harassment, amongst other allegations. She said that she'd handed over $47,000 to the school, with the understanding that she was buying part ownership in some of its business interests, but she never received anything in return. She also claims that John C. Kim told her to only date Um Myung Do instructors, and that she was not to socialise outside of the organisation. While the school's website still contains many mentions of John C. Kim, nowhere does it mention his death. But Russell Johnson managed to locate the death certificate of his former idol. According to the certificate, John C. Kim passed away from cardiogenic shock, myocardial infarction, and coronary artery disease on the 14th of February 2016. He was 82 years old, and as far as we know, hasn't yet raised himself from the dead. The following quote is attributed to Grandmaster Ian Kim on the Um Myung Do website, under the heading, My Philosophy for Success in Life. I believe in the principles of the mountain and the water. Just like the mountain and the water, I know who I am and what I believe. My beliefs cannot be changed. I can be attacked by wind or fire and all other destructive forces, but they fall before me. Though these dark forces try to change me, to rob me of my destiny, I cannot be changed because I am like the mountain and the water. I have survived numerous attacks and endured great pain, but my spirit has always been at peace because I am like the mountain and the water. I am in harmony. My mind transcends my body. It is true Mu Do that has brought me this peace and strength, as it has done for so many others throughout the centuries. It is true Mu Do that provides the miraculous daily life benefits for those who truly believe and are willing to study. The same Mu Do that has been practiced by true grandmasters for centuries has always been my spiritual guide and inspiration. For me, the Mu Do morals are the mountain and the water. Living by Mu Do morals has given me great success of mind and body throughout my life. As a result of my successes, there are two things I want to accomplish. First, I want to pass down the teachings of true Mu Do to future generations in the United States. I want many others to experience the same benefits that I have felt, to experience harmony in their relationships, family, work, religion, and much more. If it is destined, I will find the right instructors to pass down my Mu Do knowledge. Second, I want to pass down the Mu Do therapy and cures for many ailments. Just like the mountain and the water, this Mu Do knowledge, passed down to the right individuals, will endure through time and continue to benefit people generation after generation, long after I'm gone. I believe this is a way to have success in my life. This episode, it seems right to leave the final word with Russell Johnson, who spent so many years of his life in Chung Mu Kwan, and then so many more investigating the group he'd once wanted to dedicate himself to. You know, there's still people that believe that John C. Kim can do all this stuff. And what he did, the amount of people that he hurt, he, he does not deserve that admiration that some people have towards him. They need to know that, you know, he was a monster, that he hurt a lot of people and that he wasn't a good man. Just about every place that I, that Chumacuan had a school, I found uh, records of people uh, being injured or assaulted, lawsuits. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And today people are so afraid to talk about them. And I'm hoping I'm changing some of that, that they see that nothing's happened to me and they can talk now.
Don't forget to check out Russell Johnson's podcast, Deceived, The Moo Years, if you found this interesting. And he's also writing a book about his experiences and hoping to make a feature film as well, so be sure to keep your eye out for those down the line. This is the final episode of our second season of Let's Talk About Sects, so I want to take a moment to thank all of my interviewees, voice actors, the many journalists and academics whose work has helped form my understanding of various groups, our amazing Patreon supporters, and you for listening. I'll be getting to work on the third season, so feel free to drop me a line if there's a group you think I should look at. I'll be planning some bonus content in the off-season for our Patreon supporters, and you can also stay in the loop via our e-newsletter and social media channels, all of which you can find links to via www.ltaspod.com. Be sure to stay subscribed and you'll be notified when Season 3 kicks off in a few months' time. In the meantime, if you'd like to support the podcast, please mention it to friends or family who you think may be interested, or share an episode on social media. Personal recommendations go a long way. You can support the podcast's creation with a small monthly donation at patreon.com slash ltaspod. Really and truly, every little bit helps keep the project going. If you miss my voice in your ear, I've been working on an episode for ABC Radio National that will hopefully be on the airwaves and podcatchers in the next few months. I'll definitely let you know on our social media and e-newsletter. Our podcast music composer Joe Gould has been working on the third album of his band, The Crooked Fiddle Band. And if you like his work on the show, listen out after the credits for a little preview of that. In other exciting news, Let's Talk About Sects has been named a finalist in the Australian Podcast Awards for the Independent True Crime category, so keep your fingers crossed for us on the 18th of May. If you've been personally affected by involvement in a cult, or would like to support those who have been, you can find support or donate to Cult Information and Family Support if you're in Australia via www.cifs.org.au and you can find resources outside of Australia with the International Cultic Studies Association via www.icsahome.com. Let's Talk About Sects is researched and presented by me, Sarah Steele. Sound design and music is by Joe Gould. All information sources are listed on our website at ltaspod.com. Thanks for listening, and hope you can join me again next season. Hi, it's Joe here. You might know me as the composer and sound designer for this podcast, or occasionally the voice of some cult leaders along the way. If you like the sounds I make for Let's Talk About Sects, you may or may not enjoy some of my other musical projects. The main one is called The Crooked Fiddle Band. It's a mashup of folk, soundtrack music, and post-rock. Brian Eno makes some pretty strange sounds, and even he said he'd never heard anything else like it. And Bill from Faith No More said that we did one hell of a job on our recording. We're about to launch a new album, and you can help us make it happen by pre-ordering a copy over on Possible. Otherwise, just look us up on social media or Spotify, or head to crookedfiddleband.com for the latest updates. Hope you enjoy it.